right? And it said, now it says we went live. You might see that. I don't believe it. So now what I do is I go to my Twitter feed, right? So I just clicked on my Twitter feed and now I'm going to scroll down and it hasn't hit up just yet. So I'm going to refresh it. And now I go back and I see if we're there. And then I go to comments because I'm not at the comments and people have to tell me I'm here. We did it. I told you we did it and we did it again. Thank you so much. Shuttle IO. Thank you so much. Hey, Avery, how are you? We need to put people in space, Avery. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I see Pizona is here also. And um, I see Kawka is here who says, I go to Twitter. Well, this is kind of funny because I do too. Um, so um, Kawka, thank you so much for joining us. Says, I go to Twitter more than Google now when looking for an answer. Isn't that funny? Because I do also. I spend, I look at Periscope more than I, uh, I watch TV. So isn't that kind of crazy? So uh, I am so happy to be joined by uh, such a distinguished person. We've been planning this for a long time, right, Paul? Yes, we have. <laughs> yeah, we have. I'm so excited about it. Um, but I want you to introduce yourself. So can you spend a little bit of time uh, introducing yourself? Would that be all right? Yeah, I don't know. Given my age, you know, there's lots of things I would have to mention in introducing myself. Start at the beginning. I don't know. I, I, I was born in New York City. Uh, Too early. Uh, a week and a half that. before Pearl Harbor. Is that what you want to hear? Yeah, I know. No, but you're really, you're academic. I'm just so fascinated by your, your academic background, your right. familiarity, how much you've written about this. Um, you know, I, I, I have published 15 books and probably several hundred articles. Uh, and in several languages, because I write in French and German uh, as well as in English, and I read about ten languages. And the the subject that has been uh, of greatest interest to me, I think, probably in the last ten to fifteen years, is fascism, and more recently, anti-fascism, uh, which I argue is a much more a powerful and dangerous movement than fascism. Um, I, I do not see Nazism as a generic fascism. I think it is different. It is more violent, more nihilistic. Uh, the, the, the Latin manifestations of this uh, form of authority, nationalist authoritarianism or revolutionary nationalism, I think are the more typical forms that it has taken. Um, but uh, so ever since the 1930s, we're, we're dealing with a phenomenon called anti-fascism. Go well, ahead. Paul, before we go there, we still need your background because your background is so impressive and uh, not just your academic background, but your kind of uh, intellectual credentials um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, your scholarship. Was it Guggenheim? Was it a Guggenheim? I was a Guggenheim recipient. M most recently, I've been the editor of Chronicles Magazine, the editor-in-chief of Chronicles Magazine, and I'm blessed with a very good staff that actually does most of the work. Um, and we, we represent, uh, if you will, the old right. Uh, which is not not the one that you see on Fox News. Uh, we're never invited on to Fox News, obviously. Uh, we never write for the Wall Street Journal. Um, but you know, we're, we're we're basically critical of most political cultural changes that have occurred in the United States and throughout the Western world, uh, probably in the last seventy or to eighty years. And uh, I, I think it's important to see that what distinguishes us from others is that we are looking at long root causes. Or the the the, the um, rather the root causes that the problems we face did not come about because second wave feminists became third wave feminists, or because the civil rights movement suddenly decided that they wanted affirmative action or something like that. Um, uh, I think the revolution we're living through is a process, and it started a long time ago in the United States, and it is becoming, you know, incrementally more radical. And what we're seeing now, if you will, is the latest, maybe the last phase, because I can't imagine how it's going to get more radical than what we're seeing now. <laughs> and um, one of the things I wanted to discuss here, and it's really what brought us here, is, um, and again, you missed your academic credentials, so I'm going to go back there a little bit, just um, so everybody joining us has a sense of, uh, you know, what you've been doing academically for the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years of your life. <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, I, I, I have been uh, working in a number of areas of scholarship. Um, 
I started out as a class, as, as a, uh, interested in Hellenistic historiography and uh, modern European history. Uh, and then I branched out into political theory. Um, I, I've written books on various subjects like uh, the German philosopher Hegel, who interested me a great deal because he's a philosopher of history and I'm interested in philosophies of history. Um, I've, I've also, um, uh, I've also written on Leo Strauss, who is sort of a guru to uh, much of the sort of establishment conservative uh, um, uh, crowd that we see on Fox News, which writes for National Review and so forth. And I've written a number of books on the conservative movement. Um, and, uh, you know, they're important, uh, sh showing the changes that has undergone since the middle of the of the 20th century. So you can say I sort of moved from more antiquarian areas of scholarship uh, to almost current events. Uh, and I've really focused on political movements probably for the last 20 years in, in, in my work. And, um, and none of this really surprises me. Oh, here, yeah, an echo. Hmm, that could be, is that me? That might be you. I, um, when uh, I wanted to discuss kind of fascism, and I wanted to start where we are kind of now. Um, mm -hmm. I want, and you and I were just going over this right before we went live, right? Is uh, some of the visuals are just amazing. So I wanted to share the visuals with people. Um, and uh, a friend has uh, had just did a documentary, but um, he also has a book coming out. So that's actually going to be part two of this, which is his Jack Kosovic infiltrated Antifa. And I had mm -hmm. first heard of Antifa from you. Do you know that? I was listening to one of your uh, interviews maybe six or seven years ago, and uh, I heard you saying you were really worried about Antifa, and you presented, yes, and uh, I had only known of them as this kind of um, kind of an insurgency that really didn't have any uh, uh, momentum behind it, and uh, you had really described it as a very powerful social movement that was able to kind of disqualify any type of uh, counter. Uh, Right. Well, what, what, I, what I try to show uh, is, is not just the pre that we have a present Antifa or Antifa movement, which has become a pain in the neck uh, and which Joe Biden insists is just an idea, uh, an idea that becomes very nasty and starts burning down cities every now and then, um, uh, wearing these uh, black masks and so forth. Uh, but what I, I'm dealing with is anti-fascism as a movement and anti-fascist violence uh, goes back a long way. I mean, you had the uh, the Red Brigades, right? Uh, and uh, uh, that were wrecking havoc in Germany, Italy, elsewhere, and uh, killing statesmen and uh, uh, trying to overthrow the government. Uh, then you have an anti-fascist movement in England that engages in violence. So it was not only here, it was also in Europe that you see the rise of these violent movements uh, uh, claiming to be uh, checking a fascist or far rightist or Nazi movement that's in progress. Uh, the, uh, in the earlier period of time, this movement was identified with capitalism or advanced capitalism or the America, the Western side in the Cold War that were fighting the Soviets. Uh, uh, but Antifa has changed as the left has changed. And now it focuses on sexism, racism, discrimination, uh, homophobia, and so forth, issues that were not particularly important in the earlier manifestation of anti-fascism. Those, the, the, these are all intersectional politics which have come to dominate the left. But the anti-fascist movement in an earlier phase was essentially a Marxist revolutionary movement. Uh, so we've, we've, they still use some of the same language, but they're not Marxist in, in the same way. I'm going to get a little bit uh, confusing, maybe for me, maybe for other people, but I'm so fascinated by this and, and the words you're using. And again, I want to go to the visuals and I snatched some of uh, Jack Kosovic's movie. So I got some really good visuals. You were looking at them. It's scary, right? Is uh, how do you define kind of cultural Marxism? I'm at a loss for these, these things. I, I know that uh, they're used improperly and that they're yeah. used without any type of an agreement on what it is but I don't really know what it is. So how do you define Marxism? How do you define fascism? And I'm just gonna go down the list with you for the terms you use. 
you know, a lot of my writing is semantical. Like, you know, I'm always arguing, we call liberalism, there's nothing to do with liberalism, conservatism, there's nothing, what we, that we keep changing the meaning of words. So they have just the kind of rhetorical uh, misrepresentation or terminological misrepresentation. But um, the, uh, uh, when I use the term cultural Marxist, I do it with, with profound regret because I don't think these people are Marxist. Uh, although the word cultural Marxism comes into fashion um, already in the interwar period when you have the Frankfurt School, uh, which is uh, established in Germany and which tries to merge traditional Marxism, revolutionary socialism, <clears throat> um, with uh, a, their own form of Freudian psychology. And uh, these, early, uh, these early sort of uh, Freudian Marxist uh, um, are called cultural Marxists. The term uh, in German, um, Kultur Marxistin or Kultur Marxist, is a derogatory term. What it means is these people are just like, you know, Marxists pretending they're something else. Um, in my analysis, um, I argue just the opposite, that these people are not Marxists, they're something else. They're on, they're on the revolutionary left, they hate the bourgeoisie, but they're not socioeconomic Marxists. This plays only a very small role. You know, um, if you ask somebody like uh, Ocasio-Cortez, what is the enemy we're fighting? It's fascism. You know, it's, it's not capitalism. Moreover, most of the, we call cultural or the intersectional politics or cultural Marxism is subsidized by corporations. It's almost an extension of corporate capitalism. I mean, how can we call this Marxism? Um, you know, it, it enjoys this. Go ahead. How, yeah, how would you kind of uh, define AOC in terms of uh, a political identity? Like, what uh, what is the term you would use, and what are the properties that you would give it? Yeah, I mean, she does try to drag along, as does Mark Bray, who wrote the Antifa Handbook. They try to drag along some communist Marxist language, and they will even appeal to the communist movement of the third nineteen thirties or something like that, and occasionally. They'll say, you know, we have to nationalize something, but they're not serious socialist or Marxist. Um, they're basically fighting gender identity, whiteness. Um, people want to restrict immigration. Uh, these are not traditional Marxist uh, uh, points of contention. The Communist Party opposed immigration in France because they, for the same reason that we hear the right now opposing it because it hurts the indigenous workforce. This was a communist argument. Um, they certainly, communists accepted gender identity and they hated homosexuals. You know, they, they persecuted homosexuals. So, I mean, how, how are you a Marxist? I don't, Marx didn't like homosexuals. Um, Kay Guevara hated homosexuals and he hated blacks. So uh, I'm not sure that any any of this stuff really fits into a traditional Marxist or or communist Marxist or, or Marxist Leninist framework. It's something, it's something different. Um, just as we use the word conservative now, we mean something very different from what it meant 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. So I think the meanings of these terms have, have changed. <clears throat> Is there any agreement amongst, uh, I hate to say the AOCs as though that's a disparaging thing, and I really don't want to think that way, but is there any agreement within that own kind of a community what that what those terms mean? Yeah, I mean, I think they understand each other. They hate white people. They hate males. They're allied to LGBT, which has nothing to do with Marxism. Um, and there, you know, and there are a lot of capitalists. I, I, th I think a point may be reached um, uh, when some of these more radical um, uh, types who really do attack capitalism. Uh, may uh, alienate some of their world capitalist uh, supporters, but it hasn't happened yet. You know, so we're, we're, we're going to skip so, around a little bit because I still have a lot of questions, but uh, there's so many people here and I want to be responsive to everybody. I hear an echo. Um, that could be me, right? But um, Rising Serpent says, is, um, there's an echo on your side, I think, Paul. So is this at the most basic level an annihilation of Western civilization? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Annihilation of civilization per se, but, you know, more specifically of Western civilization, which these people 
you know, condemn as sexist, racist, whatever. I don't know, anti-Semitic. You get you get the Jewish new uh, 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 elements of this too. You know that the Christians are bad. So I mean, you know, what what it, what it does represent is cumulative grievances against Western civilization coming from various quarters. And the end, of course, would be the total destruction of Western civilization. And what do they, um, what do they foresee on the other side of that? What emerges uh, as a consequence of uh, a collapse of Western civilization? You know, I really don't think they have much of a positive vision. I think they're, I think they're violent and nihilistic. Um, and you know, this is one of the reasons I compare them to the Nazis. Uh, the Nazis, unlike the communists, do not really have a positive vision. Uh, you know, they'll talk about an Aryan world or a new uh, German race. Or now, I want to understand. When you say, now, when you're using the, when you're saying Nazis now, can you just give me kind of some uh, context for that? Are you referring to people these days? I mean, I from the German Nazis. <laughs> the German Nazis were in power. Okay, uh, gotcha. I'm saying that that what makes them similar in my mind. Now, there, there are certain there are certain. Um, uh, uh, ob obvious interlap or um, uh, or overlaps that I see or intersection be be uh, uh, between these movements, but they, they do remind me more of the Nazis than the communists in, in, in two ways. Number one, uh, like the brown shirts, you have the Black Lives Matter and this, and they're just violent. They just burn down cities and so forth. But they enjoy, but like the Nazis, they enjoy a, a base of support. Right. There's a kind of support system that they have. They're not just isolated nuts like the Communist Party in the United States in the 1950s or so, which had very little support, really, although there were people who were soft on the communists and so forth. But, you know, people weren't running to join the Communist Party. Um, but these people have a very large base of support in the Democratic Party. You know, I mean, there's an enormous, they have tens of millions of supporters in the Democratic Party who really like them, who are, who are, who are behind it, the riots and behind Black Lives Matter and so forth. So the base of support is something that they shared with the Nazis on there and also the, the, the nihilistic violence. Uh, second of all, I don't think that they have any positive vision. Uh, they want to just burn down and destroy. Um, and this is something I think is also true with the Nazis. I'm not sure the Nazis have much of a positive vision besides killing a lot of people, you know, in some vague notion of an Aryan uh, future or something like that. <clears throat> They're mostly about conquest and destruction, taking power and destroying enemies. Um, and uh, the, uh, the current left acts very much, and the anti-fascist act, uh, left acts very much in the same way. Um, <clears throat> And the, uh, I distinguish them from, let's say, Italian fascists who seem more civilized. You know, they want to create a, a, a kind of neo-Roman empire or Roman state or some, and we might say it's nonsense, but there is sort of some sort of vision there and a respect for civilization, uh, which you find in Italian fascism. I'm going to bring up some videos that I want to invite you to I think that's an echo on your side. You might have to mute Asian. Did you just mute? Did you mute? Uh, Paul, can you mute it on your side? Because I hear a little bit of an echo. But so um, I want to uh, to share some videos that we were discussing, we were talking, and we were looking at right before we began that are disturbing, and that kind of brings us to this conversation, which is uh, Nazi. You know, I, as a kid growing up, there was kind of a requirement that we learn about Nazis. I mean, I remember as a kid reading Mein Kampf. And it wasn't, uh, it was almost everybody at that point was reading it. So we could have a kind of a, an idea of, of uh, what it was and how a human being can become so distorted. Right, right. right. And how we can become so displaced from a society. I remember reading it. And then uh, I remember reading, uh, I think everybody did, right? At that time, I'm 54, The Rise of the Third Reich. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And um, that was almost required reading. You know, I mean, I was an inquisitive kid, but it was required reading. And now I see no. And, you know, my wife's lost family to uh, the Nazis. They were in Poland. Uh, mm -hmm. and also lost family to the pogroms in Russia. So mm -hmm. um, so I have a good sense of uh, the history. However, it's really become kind of like a washed up Polaroid for me. And I don't see any opportunity for me to really refresh my memory. And I'm 54. So I really can't be the only one. 
And I see all of these kids uh, calling people Nazis. And so I, I have, uh, mm -hmm. I want you to respond to this quick, actually, you know what I'm gonna show, I'm gonna bring up these things quickly and then um, I'll show you this. Let's go back. Hold It's craziness, but they have no, uh, they don't really identify who their opponent or, you know, who they're after other than this kind of a vague notion. And they're all very young. They're all very young. So there's just no way they've got any type of a, even a theoretical framework for what a Nazi is. Yeah, of course, the, the thing that makes it the most frustrating is they claim to be fighting the Nazis. And this is true in Germany today, too, when they behave exactly like the Nazis. You know, it's uh, they want to suppress everyone. They're violent. They do exactly. They want to close down any opposition, um, all in the name of fighting Nazism. Uh, and then they also condone violence and shooting people and so forth. So uh, I, I, I think what has happened is that people have extracted all the wrong lessons uh, from from Nazi uh, Nazi tyranny. But now um, let's look at what the lessons are, right? So let's look at what these kids are being exposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's frightening. And you and I were just going over this and Jack Posobiec and I have discussed it. And uh, it's frightening because this is how history is imprinting these kids. So here's right. the first one from Jack Posobiec's movie, um, Antifather documentary. So I'm just going to share the, I'm just going to share the videos of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's progress a little bit. Let's let it roll on a little bit. We see kind of the style. It's a very forceful style. Um, and um, now let's move on to what the next image. So these kids are seeing this type of image. On or before January 20th, Donald Trump will no longer be the commander in chief. He will lose control of the army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, special forces, and America's nuclear arsenal. On January 20th, Donald Trump will become the commander in chief of a different army. This army. That's frightening. I mean, just the two visuals together, but those two visuals together is the history that these kids are being, and these even adults are being imprinted with, and there's no reasoning in between the two of them. For them, well, history has collapsed, but for them, history yeah, the most has frightening thing are, are, are the, the media in the United States, which pushes this stuff, which practices gross intolerance, which tries to cancel people who disagree, you know, and are obvious totalitarians. They want totalitarian power and they want a peace in a monolithic totalitarian regime that they're trying to uh, uh, right now establish in the United States. I, I don't think this is gonna work, however. I am an optimist in the long run because I think these people are too disunited and too crazy. Um, but, but how do you restore? Uh, I think you might have to mute. But how do you restore any type of uh, equilibrium into their minds when these are the images? There's nothing in between those two images. There's mm -hmm. the absolute outrageous uh, images of the Third Reich and of Hitler, and those videos right, continue. Right. And then the next ones are kind of a contemporary version. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's the same issues, like they've collapsed all of history. Uh, yeah, well, the, 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 problem, the problem is that uh, over 74 million people and possibly more voted for Donald Trump in the last election, and they don't believe any of this stuff. Uh, and uh, I think if the present administration proves as incompetent uh, and as dangerous as it, as it will soon become, or as, as it already is, uh, they're just going to lose voters. Okay, but let's uh, look. At, but let's just look at what it is. And I hate to interrupt, but I actually I don't hate to interrupt. Go ahead. This is like our dinner, and so many people are joining us, right? So mm -hmm. if this were a dinner just between us, I would kind of interrupt her. Right? Uh, is you know the 74 million people who voted for Trump, and I'm not advocating for or against. You know, I, everybody knows I try and stay away from it because I'm working on my log, right? Um, mm -hmm. But those 74 million people also have the same kind of uh, disadvantage in information, right? They, they just know that I, that, you know, those 74 million people also don't have that history, uh, that informed history. So all they can say to themselves is I'm not a Nazi. 
They still don't have. I, uh, they, you know, I'm not. A, they're, skeptical, I'm not a they're, skeptical, they're skeptical of the accusations that are made or the identification you just showed me. And that doesn't mean that they know what it is. It doesn't make any difference. I mean, I you know, I'm around. I live in a town full of deplorables. No one would believe Donald Trump is Hitler. Okay, I mean. Uh, and the people who might buy this are the people who already are, are disposed in that direction. That's what I would argue. To me, the bigger problem is that, you know, the left, uh, or, or that is a lie to the Antifa, Antifa, have already occupied the government, the Secret Service, are taking over the military in this country. It's going to be very hard to, put, to get those things back. The, Democra the, the Democrats, by which I mean, I don't mean the, the Hubert Humphrey Democrats, the the uh, the leftist totalitarian Democrats like uh, uh, like like our former president Obama uh, and his supporters were very very careful to put their guys in charge of everything um, and this to me is the immediate danger uh, that they're going to use their power uh, to go after opposition and they're and, how do you restore uh, the, support of the media but how do you restore so again they've collapsed history when I say they I'm referring to kind of a a collective it's really not just one person or one party right is uh how do you kind of inform now how do you resolve that disequilibrium and that kind of collapsing of history and kind of inform everything that's in the middle kids today are not learning about nazis they're not learning about the holocaust what they're learning is what that clip you saw a punch a nazi doesn't really need to identify who you're punching only a nazi how do you yeah, well, i mean it's, it's good you already have people who are predisposed to believe those things for various reasons. Um, and they would believe them even if they didn't see those pictures. That's what I would argue. They're already the armies of the left. They're the people who are going to vote for the left, um, who see you know anyone who opposed them as another Hitler. They hear this on national public radio and so forth. Uh, you hear this in universities. Uh, some believe it, others don't. Um, the people who don't attend the A-League universities don't, don't, uh, don't, don't get exposed. See, I don't see it as exclusively a left issue. You know, I, I see a kind of a, a universal issue that if you're not educating people on what something is, then everything is that thing. So, you, you know, know I, I, I know this is strange coming from a scholar and historian, but you know, I, I think many people can, can live with minimal knowledge of history as long as their morals are good, uh, they're decent people, uh, and they love their country, they love their family, they fear God and so forth. These are fine people. Um, it'd be very nice, you know, they take my history classes, they, they, I, start, I don't think I changed their lives very much. I think they were going in the right direction. Uh, it is the other people I find scary, the intellectual elites. I mean, they terrify me. They, the people with the high IQs terrify me because because they're, they're the ones who are going to destroy us. Uh, if, there's any, if there's any group that's going to pollute our society, destroy us politically, take away our freedom, it's the, it's the smart people and the intellectuals who I think are extremely dangerous. Uh, so I'm not terribly concerned about my neighbors who don't know much about history. You know that that, that I they they're perfectly decent people. We're gone being decent. Now I am concerned that their children or grandchildren might start to believe these things. So I think I think it is necessary to counteract these narratives. Um, but I I don't think that if the pictures you showed me are going to have an immediate impact on tens of millions of people or anything like that. I don't even believe that this nonsense project 1619 that shows America was founded as a racist slave society and this, uh, I, I sort of wonder how much impact it's really going to have uh, on the younger generation. I, I just, I don't know, but. It's an interesting question because I think about this a lot and I worry about this a lot because, um, you know, if, is that your answer? That's so fun. So, you know, if you just look at it in terms of temporal isolation and you say, you know, this kid's reading the book and they can kind of dismiss it because there's an absurdity to it. Right. Or, the, you know, these visuals of Punch and Nazi and Hitler have an absurdity to them. Um, however, that um, in five years, that imprint, it becomes real. So it doesn't make a difference if it's not real today. It's real in five years. It's real in 10 years. So the history that you know, they, the, what's being introduced to them today, and in terms of punch and Nazi, it's a very dangerous thing. What's being introduced to them today doesn't need to be true. I remember going on your YouTube thing, discussing this. It doesn't need to be true today. They're imprinting history for tomorrow. 
And yeah. if you if you Google Nazi, right, you get a lot of it's it's because of all the news. If you Google white supremacy, it's all Trump and Trumpism. There, uh, there is very little opportunity for a kid to wander a bookstore and uh, kind of learn of, of true history because so much of the best sellers now and the best sellers on TV and the best sellers that hit Google search are uh, are are ludicrous. I mean, there's just there's an absurdity to them, a Monty Python type of absurdity, except it's not funny. Yeah, there's also also there's a problem here, which is a, a saturation point. I mean, you 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 turn on TV, you get the cable movies and so forth. They're all about evil white racist uh, uh, Southern bigots carrying Confederate flags who shoot homosexuals. I mean, every every movie you see is something like socialist realism, you know, in the Soviet Union. It's a propaganda movie. Uh, and, and you sort of wonder who watches this stuff. I mean, fortunately enough people may, so it, will, it, will, it would affect us. But one of the things that I find really frightening is the head, I think she was the head of the si Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust, the study of the Holocaust. And she's the most prominent Holocaust study uh, 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 scholar, or supposed scholar in the United States, Deborah Lipstadt. Um, who tells us that, you know, Trump is exactly like Hitler. And anyone who questions the election is a Holocaust. You're like a Holocaust denier. It's the but same so thing. How do you respond to that? That's a really interesting point. And again, I think I think this woman is utterly disgusting. But, uh, so let me, but let me just trivialize the Holocaust by comparing it to a, somebody in the opposite party she voted against. But how do you I mean, this is unbelievable. But how do you respond to that? Because the media does not permit any type of a dialectic or type of uh, discourse. There's nothing that challenges her. There's no type of uh, interplay, right? There's nobody you have, who to create, you have to create an alternative media. And I think this will happen. Um, I think we will get, you know, uh, uh, libertarian counterparts to this, uh, th this leftist totalitarian electronic media and the, the uh, uniformly anti-white, uh, anti-heterosexual, anti-Christian, whatever uh, television stuff. I think this will come along in time. I think the mistake that some people on the right are making is saying, well, you have to, to explain that if you don't like our speech, you have to engage in debate. Well, these people don't believe in debate any more than Hitler believed in debate. They okay, want to destroy you it. When you use the term Hitler, all right, does that also have the same type of uh, kind of a simplicity, the loss of kind of a like a, what I think of as a postcard that's filed away? Is that, or are you using it more kind of precisely academically? I mean, did Hitler permit any type of uh, debate within? His right, no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it for effect, but I, obviously these people have the same view of free speech that Hitler did, that there should be no, no open, open discussion, that anyone who engages in an open discussion should be criminalized. Um, and this, this, seem, this seems to be the, the view. The, uh, the, the alternative is, you know, is, to, is, is not to have, you can't have a debate with them, with them. They know what they're doing. They want power and they want to destroy you. Uh, uh, the, the alternative is to create your own, your own alternative media, if you, you know, uh, something like Parler or so Rumble, some of the other, other ones. And, uh, or create your own alternative stock trading platform. Have you seen that thing? It's crazy. So I want to show you this. So JL0204862, wait, right? I'm going to have to study that, right? Is I'm going to put it on a flashcard says, uh, and I'm asking you this, so, uh, so JL, thank you so much for being here, says socialism is a gateway to fascism and communism, uh, all our totalitarianism. You want me to respond? Of course. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> um, I, I don't like socialism. I would agree that socialist um, regimes land up taking away our freedom. Uh, although they do not necessarily result in totalitarianism, except through a very, very long, complicated process. Um, fascism, at least the generic fascism, uh, is, is phony socialism. They do very little to nationalize anything, you know, and in Nazi, even in Nazi Germany. So they confiscated the property of Jews and other people in the, you know, the, the regime didn't like. But it still remained a, you know, a, a free enter, to some extent, a free enterprise government with private ownership. Communists, of course, just wreck the economy. Um, and uh, generally, I would say that socialism is a bad policy for among other reasons, because it destroys other freedoms. It is not just economic freedom. This person is right. 
socialist regimes land up taking away um, other freedoms as well, which has been the case with all social democracies. You know, they go in the direction not not just of economic control, but of control of education, control of, of, of the family and so forth. So that socialism, you know, to quote my late friend, Roger Scruton, is less about economics than all the other things that the socialists want to do. So uh, I want to help define these terms for me and hopefully for everybody else too, right? Because we're all kind of kids in the, in, the back, in, the, in the classroom and you're definitely the professor. So can you help me understand these words, socialism, fascism, communism, the way you kind of, uh, you know, you're in your own kind of thinking, how, how you're kind of categorizing and defining these terms in your own conversations? Yeah, I mean, socialism to me involves collectivization of the economy, nationalism, in the classical sense of socialism, um, uh, uh, nationalization of the economy, uh, so that, you know, all, all of the major industries belong to the state, <clears throat> even if you allow, you know, some mom and uh, mom and pop store to remain uh, operative, you know, run, run by Korean immigrants or something. But but all, all the major um, uh, segments of the economy, <clears throat> um, all the, the major productive forces belong to the government. Um, and the government uh, massively redistributes income. Okay. Uh, so that, that is classical socialism. Um, uh, you have something, this occurs in England after the Second World War in the Athlete government, which goes m much, much farther, as I point out in my book on fascism, in collectivizing the economy, controlling income, than fascist Italy ever went. I mean, there's like no comparison. Um, so, um, you know, the, uh, you, you, you can have socialism even, you know, in a, in a democratic parliamentary system that is voted in, but you will be much less free as a result, not only because the government controls the economy, but typically because they create vast bureaucracies which oversee the family. You have social policy, which we have now in the United States, of course, even though we haven't collectivized yet the in productive forces, we may never do that, but we have all the, all the other accompaniments or the, uh, you know, of socialism in terms of government control of the family, gender relations and so forth. <clears throat> um, like, you know, you think women are going to be liberated because you're going to have an abortion, but actually it's something given to women which men have no control over. So it is the woman who decides this. The man is sort of, you know, he's he's sort of rejected as a second class citizen by the state that is extending this supposedly extending women's freedom. Um, uh, almost everything that is done for women's liberation, gay liberation, vastly expands the power of the state to control family, to control social relations, and to punish people who don't go along with the policy that is being enforced. And that's a requirement. Uh those are kind of the unique properties of a socialist system. I mean, is that something that's required to, in order to uh, meet the, the definition, kind of the academic definition of socialism? No, it does not. Um, because people typically give you economic definitions of socialism. What I am arguing is that socialism has social and cultural implications, which go well beyond the economic policies that are introduced by socialist governments. So how um, does socialism, how does, and then I, I want to get into fascism and communism also, but how does socialism kind of uh, repress uh, dissent and opposition? Is there a kind of a usual a tactic that is it kind of, uh, that all these socialist, socialist systems kind of employ? Because you're gonna have a lot of pissed off people when you distribute poverty. Yeah, no, what, what, I, what I'm saying is that there's not a direct connection between the two. Uh, just because I'm collectivizing the economy and taking all, all your economic choices, or most of them, does not mean I'm going to deny you free speech. But it, usually the two go together. Because once the government can claim all kinds of power to regulate you economically, once it controls property uh, and is free to take away your property as well, usually, uh, there are other things that it can do. Uh, to, you know, to force you into conformity because it's taken over a, a very large part of your life and uh, it engages in something called, so all socialist governments uh, engage in something called social policy. Uh, we do here too, although we are not formally socialist. Um, and what, the, what this means is that, you know, the state takes upon itself the obligation to colonize your family. Um, 
you know, to define relations between men and women, parents and children. You see this in socialist countries all the time. Oh, really? That's something. So is that something is Venezuela? Would you say Venezuela is a socialist country? Uh, that the, the, you know, if, if, if they were able to set up a viable system, one that worked, they might. But you see it in Sweden, which is a socialist country. The government mm -hmm. controls families, everything else. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been a socialist country since the 1920s. And so fascism. Um, and I know you go into it because I've read your book after liberalism. And I was just in fact, I was just reading your book on, on fascism. Uh, which also brought me to this fascism, the career, um, the career of a concept, right? Fascism, mm -hmm. the career of a concept. So how do you define and what is the way that other people should think of fascism? Because I know what fascism is not, right? I know that when they say that person's a fascist, that that's, uh, that that's not true, right? So yeah. it's not really helpful to me. So how do you define fascism? Uh, and so then I also know what's not fascism. Yeah, by the way, not only is that not true, but when they say some populist like Orban in Hungary is a fascist, that's not true. Uh, again, they're trying to smear these people by uh, A, associating them with fascism, B, making all fascism identical with Hitler's extermination policies. So there, there, there's, 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 there's all of these connections that they're assuming when they call, so when they call Trump, Trump is a fascist, what it means is he would support the extermination of people at Auschwitz. I mean, they, they, they're all sort of run together. And when you, when, you make, when you make the first statement, as I point out on my book on anti-fascism, um, there, there, um, there are real fascists, but I, you know, I argue that fascism is, uh, is a characteristic or a movement that develops within a particular time period, a particular place. Um, uh, if you say, well, you know, we have anti-Semites uh, here, well, not, not all fascists were anti-Semites, and not all anti-Semites have been fascists. So you can't say that all anti-Semitism is fascism. Or um, all dictatorships are fascist. No, they're not. There have been dictatorships, you know, throughout human history, and they weren't fascist. So, so that, I mean, fascism is something that comes out of the First World War. It is developed by veterans of that war. Uh, and in some of the cases, it is identified with the loss of land or the failure to acquire land for Italian fascists, they were on the winning side, they didn't get enough, enough land from the losing side, from the Austrians. Um, so the, so the, 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 the fascist movement is related to taking back land. It is a nationalist movement that appeals to returning veterans of World War I. Um, and it is a revolutionary nationalist movement because it calls for revolutionary change within the nation uh, in order to protect, you know, uh, your own workforce and in order to protect uh, uh, historical members of this nation. Um, and it brings with it a particular set of economic and social reforms, like the creation of a corporate state uh, under a fascist leader. Um, one party state, I think, is not the important aspect here, uh, because, you know, if you look at, at fascist states, the emphasis is on reorganization, corporate reorganization, the creation of a fascist hierarchy, and the role of a leader who embodies the will of the people. Um, and these, these, in, in the case of Latin fascism, um, I think one can recognize certain Catholic elements, uh, like you know the the rejection of the free market, the, certainly the rejection of Marxist Marxist internationalism and the creation of a corporate economy. It's almost like a kind of neo-medieval economy that they're trying to establish in, in fascist Italy. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I suppose all of them take this over. Portugal, you have a, a, a fascist movement in Spain, uh, the, uh, the Falangistas, the Falangist movement. Uh, but they're also, the, 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 in the case of Nazism, you have something which incorporates both fascist and, and Stalinist elements. You know, it, it, it takes over much of the trappings of Italian fascism. So is there such a thing? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I hear that yeah. echo again. Yeah. It's kind of cool. I'm not getting into it. I feel like I'm in the Starship Enterprise or something. It's kind of cool. Right. So is there uh, such a thing as uh, just Nazism? And can that Nazism be kind of uh, recreated into a different time and period? That, 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 yeah, there have been attempts to revive Nazism. 
Um, I mean, you even see Nazi elements in what is it, the Golden Way or whatever there in, in, in Greece, there's a kind of neo-fascist movement, nationalist movement. It takes over some of the symbols of Nazism. Um, the Ba'ath Party in Iraq uh, took over elements of both Nazism and Stalinism. Uh, you know, this is almost sort of like window dressing. Um, but I, I think Nazism itself, and I think Ken Arendt and others who point this out, incorporates a good deal of Stalinism. Uh, and, and many of the, of the interwar, you know, Marxist critics of Stalinism pointed this out, that Hitler's Germany looks a lot like Stalin's Russia. Uh, they have concentration camps. They're terrorist regimes. Uh, they're one party states with, you know, controlled by this leader, leader on top of just about anything. And they, and they have sort of ministries of propaganda that constantly, you know, reshape the truth. Uh, generic fascism in Spain or Italy or other places uh, is not totalitarian in the same sense. But so if, not the, so is can Nazism be your thing? Is your, Nazism, oh, I hear it. It's kind of cool. I feel like I'm in a canyon. So can Nazism... Uh, is there a real legitimate fear of Nazism or Hitlerism or, you know, however, you know, described being recreated today? Is, what would uh, Nazism, right? Because I really, I'm trying to figure out all the differences of these things. What would Nazism look like today? I mean, it'd be a bureau, because they had a bureaucracy, but they were also, and I studied propaganda, but they were horrible at propaganda. So they, so they weren't able to broadcast a coherent message. I, I could not imagine, a, I could not imagine, a, you know, something that looks the same as Nazism today, because that too is dated. You know, it belongs to a particular period in European and German history. Uh, and again, it's sort of a peculiar fusion of fascism and Stalinism that you get. Uh, and much depended on the personality of Hitler. Uh, but I think there are a lot of people who genuinely believe that Nazism is coming back, you know, in the form of the Off Day in Germany or the Rassemblement National in France or some, I mean, it's ridiculous, but they do believe this. And, uh, you know, some of these people are Holocaust survivors uh, who think that it's going to happen again and anything identified with the right is Hitler or something like that. So, I mean, there are people who, as I argue, who genuinely believe it. As ridiculous as it is, they genuinely believe this because they were burnt once. Um, uh, I think most of these people running around saying that, you know, Trump is Hitler uh, are just engaging in rhetorical overkill. I don't, I don't think they really believe this. I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous. I think they do. Uh, Can I tell you something? I, I think that they do. And, uh, you know, again, I'm not a Trump person. So I, I hate being in that position where I have to, where I have to uh, kind of embed myself and burrow myself into things I really don't want yeah. to. But uh, I think... Uh, they do. I think that they've been able to persuade themselves to persuade themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that it's now become such a requirement. It's, uh, it's subconscious. There's so much disequilibrium going on in people's heads yeah. that they're very happy to uh, surrender thinking to the media and to these self-reinforcing loops. So it doesn't have to be particularly sensible to them. It just requires them kind of surrendering the, um, rationale that surrendering the kind of uh, reality that would be required to make sense of, of real quality information. Right. I, I, yeah, I, I think, I think there are two groups that may believe this. One are Jewish groups that are terrified of Nazism. And in fact, they sort of keep their group together by saying there's anti-Semitism all over the place and it's worse now than it was two days ago. And like the anti-defamation league, but there are other, there are other groups that do exactly the same thing. And at least some of those people probably believe that Trump is Hitler or something or anything on the right is Hitler uh, or that there's, you know, Nazis running all over the place. Uh, also, I think there are some of the young people who have sort of a vague idea that something terrible happened back then and it's happening again. And these sort of fit your definition or your, or your description of these people with a very vague idea of what happened historically. But, I think one of the problem but these people are very... These people are extremely smart. I know because I come out of venture capital, I come out of technology. Yeah. I know some really, really smart people, but I think of them as very horizontal intelligence. And the way I think of these people, and it's important to understand, is that uh, I think of them as 
of op as operating within an assembly line. And I think of them as operating a station on an assembly line. It's what they do professionally as developers and everything else, but yeah. it's also what they do in their own life and the way their minds have now been behaviorally conditioned to think and reprogram. Is I think of these people as uh, operating an assembly line and the product arrives at their, uh, at their station, they stamp it, and then uh, it goes on to the, the next station and there's no kind of uh, intellectual inquisitiveness about what happened before it arrived to them or what happens, you know, once it leaves them. It's a very and it's a very horizontal in intelligence. Uh, right. so, and I've seen this. So what arrives on their desk, what arrives on in their station, uh, that all it requires is their imprint, their stamp, and then it goes on to the next. Uh, they genuinely believe now. Um, and I, again, I don't want to say Trump is Hitler and all this. But they genuinely believe that um, that we're 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 just days away from uh, mass exterminations. Of, uh, but it, but it's true. They at first I didn't want to uh, want to believe it. But I you know I have so many good friends that are very liberal in some ways, and uh, I don't want to interrogate them because that's not fair to do to friends. But I you know I do inquire of them in the most pleasant way I can, and uh, they do genuinely believe it. They've persuaded themselves somewhat. They've surrendered their thinking. But what's arrived at their station, right, is that, uh, you know, that uh, we're days away from mass exterminations of immigrants arriving here in camps. They see the images. And uh, for them, the in, in images are indistinguishable between these uh, catastrophes. The only time you ever see images of the Third Reich or whatever it is, is now in reference to... Uh, a current political climate that they're trying, that the media is trying to collapse into the same thing. So I genuinely believe that some of these really smart kids in their twenties and thirties believe this. And that's part of my concern. So I want to bring up a question here, right? Cause I kind of disagree with it. I know Paul, I think is going to disagree with it, but conservatism is the last. So uh, Stacy, Stacy Lynn Rossi, thank you so much for joining us. Says conservatism is the last stand for freedom on earth. Paul, you're a conservative. You're one of my favorite conservatives. What do you think? Well, I don't know if I'm, I, I say I'm not a conservative. I'm someone on the right. Um, mm. Conservatism is what you get on television, these uh, media celebrities. And I don't think they're really conservative. They work for the Republican Party or something like that. Um, uh, I, I think the right is the last stand <laughs> of freedom, at, le at least in Western countries. How do you distinguish how do you distinguish? Yeah, I mean, I mean cons conserv conservatism, is, as I say, is whatever calls itself conservatism and enjoys recognition from the media as the conservative side. Uh, so that Dana Perino is a conservative and I'm not because I have no recognition. And what, you do, what, what they basically argue is for whatever the left was saying about 20 years ago, um, that they... Uh, uh, second wave feminism is good. Third wave feminism is bad. Martin Luther King was great. Uh, Jesse Jackson wasn't as good. We're for, we're for gay marriage, but we don't want to push around bakers who don't want to bake cakes for gay wedding. I mean, it's what they do is they're constantly compromising with the left in order to stay politically relevant. Um, and, but the right, so the right, and you're a, a kind of a, a a member of that group, right? I've heard you describe yourself as kind of a anarcho-libertarian, which I kind of like. I've, I've thought about that a lot. But so, well, I mean, that, the that, right. that, that, that is a fallback position <laughs> if, yeah. if nothing works. Um, I'm not against the state. You know, I think the state has legitimate rights and powers. And I think the development of nation states in Europe was a very positive development. Uh, I just don't like the modern managerial uh, state that tries to reconstruct us therapeutically uh, take away uh, traditional beliefs, uh, uh, destroy communities. I think I think it's 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 an absolutely pernicious force. But I'm I'm not against the state as such. We're gonna um, keep going. we're gonna keep going on. There's a lot of questions here, and I and so negligent. So um, danger will rob ten. How funny because I I think I remember that show, Lost in Space. So thank you so much for being here. It says Shining Path in Peru, and could you help me better understand what that means? What is that? Oh, the shining. Yes. Uh, they're, they're, they're the radical revolutionary group, uh, which occasionally kidnaps people, kills them and so forth. And governments have had to deal with them, you know, as, as an ongoing danger. 
Uh, I don't think they've ever been entirely subdued. I think they're still hanging out in, in Peru uh, and occasionally engaging in assassinations. So we're going to continue on. Rising Serpent, thank you so much for being here. Um, says, how does, how does destruction of the traditional family structure fit into cultural Marxism? Well, because they think that traditional family is based on inequality and the oppression of women by men um, and the oppression of children by both. So in, in order to, to free us of this supposedly fascist control, um, the state has to intervene. Uh, it has to do all that it can to destroy the traditional family, together with gender, uh, fixed gender roles. But do they want, if, if, do, are they desirous of tearing down America? So it sounds like what they want to do is they want to give all this authority and power to the state. But at the same time, don't they want to tear down the state? No, the left, left doesn't want to tear down the state. They, they want a very powerful state uh, in order to fight fascism. In the okay, form so of sexism, homophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, racism, call it what you want. <laughs> but they, 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 these, these dangers are always there. They're always lurking. Therefore, we have to have a very powerful state to combat so, them. So does um, uh, LRD, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and that's a really nice cartoon image. So uh, kind of cool. So it says Antifa is anti-government. And uh, Paul, you're, you're 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 about to publish your book on Antifa. So you and Jack yeah. are going to be part one and two because I'm so excited to do. Right. It. Jack right. infiltrated Antifa, uh, mm -hmm. so he has real uh, on feet on the ground type of uh, kind of uh, visuals and kind of interrogation of them. Right. And you've got kind of this uh, historical framework that and philosophical political science framework of it that I think is so crucial. Also, yeah, no, I I think I think uh, Antifa is is anti-government in the sense that it op opposes the government we now have. Some some call themselves anarchists, but you know I think that's simply a convenient label for them. Uh, they simply want to bring down what they see as a bourgeois, reactionary, sexist government or something like that. Um, I don't think they're true anarchists at all. Uh, I, th I think they are, uh, you know, uh, radical, statist social engineers who are just trying to destroy what we have now uh, to make way for a much more repressive government. Now, do you feel that uh, I I call them, and I went on your show calling it this, right? I think of them as the phalanx for the megacorps. I see them as really trying to displace uh, our republic, displace our political elites uh, as assertively and as violently as they can. Do you really? I mean, I, I don't see them trying to displace these people. They seem to work hand in hand with them. You know, I mean, with the uh, uh, with the reconstructed FBI, I mean, those aren't their enemies because it's going after the right. Um, they, the, the problem is they are so nutty, you know, and these out. I think this is one of the problems that the left generally faces. They're dealing with nutcases, you know, who start burning down cities, doing this. Black it's very it's hard to control them in the end, even if they are more or less allied to the uh, to the deep state well i, and to I the think, of bureaucracy i mean you and you and jack Ozebeck have a have a good view of this and i've thought about it recently that uh with these re-education camps they're going to be the first ones in whoever mm -hmm. uh, whoever strayed you know the antifa members in its own kind of hierarchy that challenged uh kind of the power structure are going to be the first ones into those re-education camps so here is jlo again jlo i'm not even going to say the number Frankfurt School of Social Theory. And you might want to give a little bit of your background with Marcuse because it's fascinating. The Frankfurt School of Social Theory was an abject failure. Yeah, I don't know if it's an abject failure. I mean, uh, I, obviously he's referring to the Frankfurt School that was developed in Frankfurt in the 1920s and uh, uh, Theodor Adorno, Max Horkheimer uh, were, were the founders. Later on, you have Herbert Marcuse and others who, who joined. And it gets relocated after 1933, it comes to the United States, uh, and it established itself sort of as, as a semi-permanent presence at Columbia. Um, and the Institute for Sozial Forschung in German becomes the Institute for Social Research in England, in, in English, right? But then they, then they go back in 1951 to Frankfurt. Uh, there's the, the Goethe uh, Universität, the Goethe uh, University, and they establish a presence there. And they and they and you, you move from the first to the second generation, which is more radical, by the way. Um, the the second generation is into massive social engineering. 
the first generation seems more theoretical. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's a failure. Uh, what happens is it becomes more radical um, in its American and German phases after the Second World War um, and is surpassed by the, by the current left, you know, uh, which is much more radical. I mean, the Frankfurt School considered uh, homosexuality to be deviant behavior. They follow Freud in this. Uh, uh, the, the, the present, our present political parties glorify this. So they're, they're more radical in some ways in the Frankfurt school. The Frankfurt school was, uh, was not as radically feminist, you know, as, uh, our, our current leftist culture is. Um, and we're going to skip around cause there's so much here. And I'm actually, I'm going to respond to this one first from Avery because, uh, both of us, I'm a big believer in Space Force, and I just want to include that so that this doesn't become depressing. I'm very optimistic, just as you are. I see a change in our political operating system, right? I think that that's evident. I think, you know, I've been talking about it for a long time, and I think now the megacorps have kind of lost the facade. Have, they no longer need to preserve the facade of continuity and all the other things. Right, right. And people are applauding their takeover. And I can live with all of that because I'm not a nostalgic person. Paul, I never learned the Constitution. I never read the founding documents. I can't really tell you what I'm leaving behind, except I like capitalism. But I like Space Force, and I've had, and I like it both on the technology, innovation, and creating jobs, but I also like it because I think that that's the only way humankind is going to be able to resolve a lot of our conflicts. Empires always have to empire, right? That's, it is what it is. So uh, let's push the empires out into space because there's a lot more uh, places that they can kind of mm -hmm. colonize and, you know, empires got an empire, right? So I want mm -hmm. them to do it in space. And I think mm -hmm. China and I, are, China and America are actually going to, because we both won the world, are going to be able to exist more favorably in space into 2100, 2200. Because we'll, but we'll be out. We'll have, we, I, I'm not just saying that. Yeah. I'm saying that this isn't just a joke. We're going to have, you know, for the first few years, there's going to be a lot of conflict as we have to establish human rights laws and certain other things. But going into 21, 2200, you're going to have people living on, on, on moons and living in space and traveling. It's just mm -hmm. such an exciting time. So um, somebody here says um, Bernie stands alone, which I'm glad people want to see principled politicians. And then they let me and then they go on. And then Shuttle IQ says. We need capitalism, not socialism, to lift us. I'm going to do a clip right now. Uh, I think I'm going to, I think, you, I'm not surprising you with it because I showed you it in advance, right? But I'm going to do a clip about, about Bernie that was very frightening to me. It was very frightening to Nancy. And, uh, you know, it just shows you, we, we got to watch out, right? This is the clip from Veritas. I'm not a fan of Veritas, but they did an undercover video. Uh, mm -hmm. It is. So if Trump gets reelected, what? Cities burn. Do you even think that some of these like mega people could even be re-educated? <laughs> I mean, we gotta try. I mean, like so, like in Nazi Germany after the fall of the Nazi Party, there was a shit ton of the populace that was Nazified, and like Germany had to spend billions of dollars re-educating people to not be Nazis. Like, we're probably going to have to do the same thing here. And that's kind of what Bernie's like, whole thing like, hey, it's re-education for everybody, because we're going to have to teach you not to be a Nazi. There's a reason Joseph Stalin had gulags, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, gulags were a lot better than like what like the CIA has told us that they were. Like, people were actually paid a living wage in gulags. They had conjugal visits in gulags. Gulags were actually meant for, like, re-education. The greatest way to break a billionaire of their, like, privilege and their idea that they're superior, go out and break rocks for 12 hours a day. You're now a working class person, and you're going to learn what that means, right? Bernie doesn't get the nomination. Bernie goes to the second round in the DNC convention. He's going to walk into the It'll start in Milwaukee, and then when they and when the police push back on that, and other cities. These people are insane. Yeah, I mean, there's always been a lot of insane people around. Um, 
Uh, Sanders is in some ways the most interesting of those politicians because he starts out as a, um, you know, as a sort of almost kind of vanilla communist. Uh, there, there's nothing really interesting about him. He likes the Soviet Union. He likes the communist. Uh, he wants total government control of the economy and so forth. Uh, then he sort of moves on and becomes a supporter of gays. Um, in his most recent incarnation, he's been entirely for the LGBT agenda and so forth, while still holding on to his Marxist socialism. So in some ways, he's sort of a fusion of the two. Um, and his cultural leftism was not what, you know, drove away Democrats and donors. It was the fact that he really was a Marxist socialist. I think that was the thing that scared them about, uh, about Sanders. And I want to just, somebody made this comment and I want to, uh, Eric Abu, thank you very much. Oh, what a cute, it's like a baboon. Is that a baboon, right? Or an orangutan. Uh, says that's just a lowly campaign field organizer doesn't represent Bernie. I never said it represented Bernie. I specifically said they're crazy. I didn't uh, make an attribute of that. I chose my words pretty carefully. So uh, I didn't say it was Bernie. Bernie, uh, of all of them, was the most genuine. Uh, I mean, it just is what it is. He was the most genuine of all of them. But, you know, politics sucks. And, you know, he kind of cashed out. But in any event, I'm not saying that uh, that represented Bernie's views. So... Um, I, I'm surprised you didn't find Kirsten Gillibrand and uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar to be the most genuine. I'm uh, joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I know all these people and it's very difficult. Politics is a difficult thing. It, it really is. And particularly now because they have to appease a very radical left. I mean, they really do in New York City and throughout the country. They have to. They have to satisfy a very radicalized left. They've got to, they're competing with all of the um, activist industrial complex. They're competing with these kind of leased out activists that are uh, have, a, have an operational infrastructure for recruiting. They can recruit very quickly. They've got all the marketing, you know, they've got all the propaganda. So they're, the left is a dangerous thing for these politicians as well. And I know that they've got to try and satisfy them. So here's a question from Lex Yusey. Lex, thank you so much for joining us. Is anti-fascism a crusade that fills a religious void in its adherence? Yes, I, I think for some people it does. Um, uh, others are just driven by hate. I mean, I, that this is the one thing that is coming uh, to um, uh, coming into my mind or is dawning on me after I've worked on these things. I, you know, back back. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, I did a book on multiculturalism and the politics of guilt. And the argument I make there is that um, uh, being on the left is almost a, sub is a substitute for religion. And it is one that seems to come out of distinctly Protestant elements, uh, that the, uh, the individual is a sinner for social reasons now. And you have to atone, and it's almost a kind of divine grace um, and, and those who recognize that they're sinners, who go around saying, you know, I'm a member of an evil race or something, uh, um, are especially, uh, especially praiseworthy, you know, so that, that there are religious elements. And as I've argued, without Christianity, it's hard to conceive of, of, of the left. Although it's a selective borrowing, you can recognize uh, certain core ideas uh, or, or, or certain kind of mythology going one, one to the other. I've sort of moved beyond that now. I think the uh, I think hate is mo mostly drives the left. The, as mm -hmm. I say, they hate or they hate normal people, or they fear normal people because I think some of these people that I met actually believe that normal people are going to kill them. You know that they're, they're going to become like Nazis or something like this. Um, by the way, I didn't mean to minimize the insanity of some of the people I mean, who actually do think that Trump is Hitler. And that, you know, if you don't let uh, somebody, some terrorists come in from somewhere, uh, the next thing will be sticking everybody in extermination camps. There are people who are crazy like that. I meet a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they, they imagine they're marginalized, which they're not. They usually have a lot of power, but they are driven by fear more than hate. <clears throat> We're going to continue on because these are such interesting questions. And I really want to discuss fascism and Nazism. So I'm going to get back to that in a certain point. But uh, I, it's a good question because I don't understand this stuff myself. So again, it's Jayla. Wow, you're all over there. And I want to also say that somebody joined us from Brazil and I had their comment ready to go next about Bolsonaro. 
but I can't scroll all the way back up. So if you could really put that again, that'd be awesome. Very interested in discussing Bolsonaro and getting uh, getting Paul's feedback on it. So JLO, that's all I'm going to say, says 1619 is the same as critical race theory. It's all Trotsky, Salolinsky, radical leftist tactics. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't think either Trotsky or Salolinsky believed in crit critical race theory. I, 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 th I think there's something else there. Um, uh, I think part of it is, is the, the hatred, as I argue, the hatred of white elites for ordinary white people and their willingness to use racial minorities, uh, people with strange sexu sexual orientations to, uh, to beat up on, on the deplorables, to beat up like on the 73 million people who voted for Trump and so forth. Now, some may in fact see these uh, Trump voters as uh, potential or incipient Nazis, but I, I think uh, th th this hatred for white people, this hatred for heterosexual males and so forth, uh, has nothing really to do with Trotsky or Solinsky, uh, uh, both of whom belong to a kind of older Marxist uh, kind of left. Um, I think what we're looking at is something which is, uh, uh, which is radically different. Um, so we're gonna continue on because this is an interesting question. Green shoots five or green shoots S, so socialism is a broad word. Lots of Europe could be called socialist by some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, you know, some libertarians have these purist definitions so that any uh, effort to create a welfare state, however minimal, is socialism for them. I, I think actually Ludwig von Mises made statements like that, the famous Austrian economist, um, <clears throat> that you know, one, once you take one step, it's going to lead and that it's, it is the beginning, it's always going to be the beginning of socialism. Um, and I, I just don't see it that way. I think you, t you typically land up with a very powerful state, managerial state, in something like a mixed economy. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would describe, let's say, France today as a socialist state. It's something in between. The same thing is true in England. Uh, to, to me, what, what is most striking about its uh, political development is this enormous managerial state, you know, which controls everybody's lives without necessarily controlling their income. And you or, wrote there's, no na there's, no, there's no nationalization of a means of production either. You wrote a classic, and I'm not just saying that kind of, um, kind of mm -hmm. embellishing it. I mean, you did, after liberalism, is considered a classic. So... Uh, it's very helpful. And uh, I think the thing I said to you when I was on your show is, you know, you wrote after liberalism and at the end of it is kind of pondering, right? The end of it, you made deliberately ponderous. And I said to you, this is it. This is after liberalism. So um, we are, uh, John Robb is here. Thank you very much. John and I just did a Periscope two weeks ago and it was so much fun. Um, we've done a few now, really smart guy. And uh, he's got a Patreon, actually, also. So go to his Twitter. It's John Rob. Love him. Um, and uh, says, aren't corporations acting as, and this is actually what John writes about. So this is a lot of his own kind of stories <laughs> as well. So he says, aren't corp corporations acting as a unified network, aggregating power far faster than the tribal left? Um, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. I don't know. I mean, are they going to come into conflict? Um, who's going to win if they come into conflict? Um, what about, you know, the, well, I, I would agree that these, these, these corporate conglomerates today uh, who are entirely in lie to the left, um, you know, cooperate with the state. My, my, my question is, at some point, will there be a break with the tribal left? And what will it look like? I mean, you know, if they, they might come in, the Black Lives Matter might start burning down their buildings, doing things like that. They're not going to spare them. Uh, in the end, as we see in Seattle and Portland and so forth. So if, 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 a, if a conflict comes, develops between, I, I think what might happen is the deep state, uh, the media, most of the media, and the corporate, the, the corporate wealth, which is politically allied to the left, uh, will join hands and wipe out the others. Um, you know, they'll, they'll get rid of all the vi people making violence. They'll say they're Nazis. Which they said in Minneapolis, they could they couldn't get they they said well they they really are far rightists that were they'll just get rid of them. 
to purge them. Uh, I could imagine that happening. Uh, but I would agree with John Robb that the, uh, the, the corporate conglomerates exercise tremendous power, far more than the working class. The working class is none <laughs> anymore. <clears throat> it's the uh, corporate conglomerates that, uh, that are, um, uh, that are definitely a major power player. And are the corporations, and I'm, this is actually for both of you, so I wish John was here, right? But he is here, so I'm asking John also, are the corporations, John has a, what he explains as kind of a alignment, right? Is it the left that's demanding alignment with its own kind of social policies and with its own kind of belligerence? Or is it the megacorp, uh, the uh, corporations demanding alignment and they're all, are they also getting that kind of alignment from the left? Well, I think I think there, there, there's there's a symbiotic relationship at the present time. You know, they're going to be on the same side. Like these uh, electronic media are going to purge everyone who's not on the left. They'll kick them off. They'll say there's just you know too, too much freedom of opinion. You hear this now that we have to control all of this stuff because these are all people who want to engage in violence. And we're we're you know everyone on the left is at least so it would appear to be in some kind of general alliance. Um, and, you know, the, the corporate giants will support Black Lives Matter. They put up Black Lives Matter signs and so forth. The, que <clears throat> the question is, you know, why are they doing this? Um, they may be doing it out of, to some extent out of fear. <laughs> uh, like they're not hiring enough blacks to work there. So we do is you put up Black Lives. We're not, you know, we're not doing enough for uh, hiring enough women. So we're going to uh, make a law against uh, gender specific pronouns, you know. So uh, some of the stuff that they're doing, I suspect, you know, are concessions to the ideological left, the, the cultural Marxist left. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there, there, there may come a time when they come into conflict. Uh, there's no reason to assume that the present situation will continue indefinitely. Their alliance, and it's interesting that you said all that because uh, you, you and John should speak, but uh, the alliance, from what I see, doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, fidelity to it. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is going to be interesting to, to see what happens next. I was actually thinking about one of John's comments today because you mentioned page, you mentioned uh, Parler, right? And I was thinking about one of John's comments today. Somebody went on our Periscope, said, well, you know, um, I don't recall whether it was a reflection of Trumpism or MAGAism or, you know, I, I don't really pay attention to this stuff. But they said that uh, that movement can't be stopped and uh, that somehow they'll be able to acquire a technology that's going to allow them and they're going to be able to communicate. And I still think about what John said. He said, uh, uh, and I'm phrasing it kind of differently than, than he did, but he said, Americans aren't uh, going to be living in uh, the, the hills of Bora Bora uh, or Tora Bora. They're not going to be living in the mountains of Afghanistan, burrowed into the size of cliffs. It's not the lifestyle that we live. And effectively, the corporations and the left can shut everything down. And uh, opposition is almost impossible because again, Americans aren't used to kind of fighting that type of guerrilla tactics and burrowed into the ground and all the requirements of having uh, the intricacies of these type of communications that would be required. And so was, I, I was thinking about that actually today. Um, so I want to skip on. So uh, Stu Monster, uh, and that's a lovely picture. You guys make a, a beautiful couple, says Nazi is short for Nazi National Socialist, which is true. But John, uh, excuse me, John, but Paul, a lot of um, Democrats, uh, no, the AOC element of it, right, whatever that faction is, mm -hmm. will, will kind of define themselves as, is it Democrat socialist or socialist Democrats? They kind of like do uh, some type of, uh, I don't know what the etymology is, but they do some type of mutation on it. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that's, that's simply a term that uh, everybody agrees to use, but it's totally irrelevant. <laughs> They're not democratic socialists. Um, they, they are, you know, intersectional maniacs um, who has occasionally come forth with uh, absolutely destructive economic uh, collectivist ideas. Um, I mean, calling them democratic socialists assumes that they're, you know, people like the Socialist Party in England uh, 40 years ago or something like that. They're, they're not. They're much more radical. In some ways, they're much more radical than the communists. Uh, so what what, the, what this does is sort of understate, you know, the radical thrust of what they're doing. So I'm going to go on. So Kier RK, um, uh, and this is your specialty, so you know all this type of stuff. 
Uh, and again, I will say you've written a lot about it, and I should really include a link in the follow-up to this, but uh, uh, After Liberalism truly is a classic. And then uh, your, you know, your, your fascism book, which I, which I really just finished recently, because I read, I think, Jonah, Jonah Goldberg's book about fascism, whatever. Yeah, it fascism. <laughs> and I hated it so much. I was like, this is really just, this is terrible. Just, well, if you want to own the libs, it's a good book to own the libs. Like if you want to sit at the dinner table and kind of own your liberal uh, uncle or whatever it is, it's, it's, I suppose it's a good book for that because it's got a kind of like a punchiness to it. But there's no uh, intellectual weight to it, uh, and I, I, I'm, I, that's the only way I could put it. It feels kind of like a, a almost a joke book, and uh, I, that's probably not fair to him and his intentions. But it, there's really not a lot of intellectual weight to it. But it's good if you want to own the libs. If you want to own the libs, it's really good. So, um, but but so um, so I just want to go back to your book, Fascism: The, the Career of a Concept, is. Uh, was your second book that I've read. And it's really also brilliant. So Kier RK says, is there, and you need to get a picture, Kier RK, is there a relationship between Italian fascists who are obsessed with futurism and tech utopians? Yeah, I, uh, the person who asked that question is obviously aware that the, the Italian fascists are aesthetically joined from a very early point uh, in, the, in the history of both with, with futurism. Uh, like one of one of the early enthusiasts for fascists was was Martinetti, uh, the Italian fu futurist who then becomes a, a fascist, um, and and a number of futurists in Latin countries are, are attracted to uh, to fascism. You would think these people would become communists, which is like more typical, you know, of the avant-garde, the artistic avant-garde. But um, uh, but futurism is very and and uh, Mussolini actually uses futurists. Uh, to create fascist art, some of the fascist art. And he's also very much of an innovator, <clears throat> like he tries to rebuild Rome um, and is very much influenced by what becomes a sort of fascist neoclassical ar ar architecture. So there is, in fact, a kind of tie-in, uh, be certainly between Latin fascism uh, and, few and, and more specifically Italian fascism and the futurist movement. I don't know about the tech utopians. The tech utopians, I think, is you know, is a bridge too far for me. But uh, uh, certainly, the Italian fascists and futurists are closely allied. And uh, they have another comment on Stormboy. I can echo again. Canyon, or on the bridge of like the Starship Enterprise, and I hear like this thing going on. So, um, and then another interesting question from them. So again, thank you very much. And it's it's a question actually. It's a comment, but it's also a question, Paul is the left is convinced that they just saved the country from fascism and a reincarnation of Hitler. And let me say, before you respond to that, Nancy and I do a lot of meditation, as I think you probably know. We listen to, you know, we listen to devotional music. It's all we really, really do, right? Um, and uh, I think uh, I one of like the yoga people, or you know, I don't want to get into it too much, but was, uh, was, was cheering on that they finally took out Trump. And it was the same day that Biden announced we were going to uh, increase the number of troops and uh, re-engage uh, milita militarily in uh, Iraq. And so it was the same day that, uh, that, you know, that was being reported about kind of our own belligerence and uh, kind of our own policy of never-ending wars, that the person was celebrating uh, the removal of Trump. And I'm not saying that Trump's leaving was a good or bad thing, uh, but there's a there is a there was an interesting moment as a contrast because they really were celebrating something that really wasn't well uh, thought out. Yeah, I, I think what you get is is a political polarization, um, and even you know even if the Democrats do something which the Republicans had done before, it's better when they do it. Um, I, I remember when Obama was uh, was elected, there was it was a black liberal. Uh, econ it wasn't a kind. It was a columnist for the New York Times, who said that oh, now that we're, we we have to pursue the war in Iraq because it is our war, um, and we have to be patriotic about the Obama administration. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously the, the, the foreign foreign policy once mattered to the left. Now it is simply a tool that they use to take power from the other side, 
And no, there really money. is no, they, and they also take money from China and from other countries that give them money. And the reason they're against Russia is they use Russia against Trump. So now let you me know. ask you a question, uh, because you're older than me. So you've seen all this and you're so much wiser than me. So I looked at this as kind of the, uh, the GOP, which I detested, which was like the Bush GOP. And, you know, I'm still pissed off that we're, that we were lied into Iraq and, you know, the whole type of thing. I'm, I still feel like we were lied to. And I remember all the things that were being told to me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still there. It's 18 years later, right? So I feel uh, when I saw in 2014, I saw the, um, that the war part of the Republican Party had uh, the, the, the GOP voters had really lost their pain tolerance for those people. They really were, they, felt they were exhausted. Yeah. They had lost yeah. their pain, they, you know, they had surrendered, they, they no longer had the pain tolerance and uh, the GOP type of people like, uh, I don't know a lot of these people's names, but kind of like that Bush type of faction, the national okay. type of faction. Yeah, I, that I saw them in 2014 start kind of their migration to the Democratic Party. So from the way you see it, has this been kind of a, a transplant that's occurred? Well, what happened was the neoconservatives who were the heart of the Republican Party under Bush, right? And they would have remained under the heart of it if you know Rubio became president or one of the one one of uh, their acceptable candidates. Uh, it, it, the the Republican Party chose Trump. Was it wasn't exactly an isolationist, but he said these wars were a mistake, and we have to pursue our national interests, which means not getting involved in more wars in the Middle East or elsewhere. So what happened was all the neoconservatives moved into the Democratic Party. Uh, you have people like Max Boot, uh, George Will, Bill Crystal. They all moved over, and they had the same foreign policy. They're the same people. Uh, Robert Kagan's wife. Um, I mean, Right, but was right. That just, yeah. But was that just an, was that just because I saw it happening before 2016, and but in 2000, yeah, I see what you're saying that 2016 it was kind of pronounced because of Trump being the candidate, but um, you know, I, I I look at it, the heart of it has been transplanted to the Democratic Party. Now the Democratic Party is torn into factions. How much they want to retain that part of it, and then uh, and then how to purge themselves of it. Um, it's it's kind of an it's kind of an interesting battle right now, but I agree with Kira, what what Kira K says. The left is convinced that they just saved the country. They look at themselves as having um, as fighting World War Three. They really do perceive. Yeah, yeah, that they, 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 I don't know whether they all believe this, but this is, is certainly the, their rhetoric, and it's the impression they're trying to give. They I think some people do believe this, but no, I I think others are just using the state power. Look at the imagery that's being used and listen to the rhetoric that's being used. And even Trump said it. Uh, he was in the White House. I forget what day it was. It was around March 20th, I think he said. Something that Angela Merkel started saying around March 11th, March 12th. It was something that kind of the world elite started saying around the same time. Is they started referring to coronavirus as a war. Uh, we can fight this war. Angela Merkel said that the country's got to come together to fight this war. Right. And it's still language that they're using. And, um, you know, I don't know. So, um you're, you're not, and I know it's running late, everybody, so I want to thank everybody for the time. We're going to go a little bit longer. Thank you for, for allowing us on your feet. There's a lot of questions here. We're going to rip through them, Paul. We are now in kind of like, not in the fastest round. We're not in the fastest right. round. I think of that as family feud. We're in like the Jeopardy round, right? The Jeopardy round. So uh, you don't just shout out the answer. You got to think about it. You know, it's kind of interesting. So um, noodles for you. Thank you so much for joining us. And what a wonderful picture that is. It says public schools don't want critical thinking, just regurgitation. And Paul, what's your comment? You come from that world. I, there's, nothing, there's nothing I can say to disagree with that statement. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's axiomatic. It's exactly what public schools are doing. Uh, and it's exactly what the public, the, uh, the teachers unions want. Uh, you know, there's, there, there's, there's very little open debate that goes on in public uh, education anymore. So can you, I was thinking about this today, can you, um, fix the problem of misinformation, right? Uh, and the government doesn't uh, trust people's ability to kind of discern between real and false. So can you fix that if you're not teaching kids critical thinking? I, I would say that the task is more difficult, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if, if you can't do it, uh, 
the question is, you know, how much are how much are kids influenced uh, about thinking styles from going to public public schools? I mean, it, it, it may depend on this. It may depend on social class. Um, my, my own impression is that sort of the working class and uh, you know the rural poor that I encounter here um, are not at all touched by what goes on in public schools. I mean, they have these big Trump banners and they think the election was stolen and they absolutely hate the left. Uh, you know, and uh, they, they went they went through the same public school. They just weren't very much, very much influenced. Uh, I think there have to be other factors that play a role here. I mean, I can see how public education would be a force together with, you know, HBO and the cable uh, stations and what they're showing and uh you know, even even what the minister preaches in the church, and so I mean, they're they're all like on the on the same wavelength. Um, but uh, it 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 seems that there are you know that, that there there is a kind of solid working class and people who are just t totally oblivious to what's going on, even though they go through public school education. There have to be other things to reinforce. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank his you. attitude. I, I wish they did actually teach more, um, because I feel that. And I noticed this a lot with, and I went on your thing and I discussed this, I noticed this a lot with COVID and coronavirus that, uh, and then what you were saying even earlier uh, about other things, about um, the person who's the head of the uh, ADL, I think you said, who has said some kind of uh, ludicrous right. things and it hasn't been challenged, is um, I haven't seen the conservatives, right? Uh, because that's who I'm kind of hoping to be the adversary and be kind of the opposition to what's going on. I haven't seen them ask any good questions, which is kind of weird because, you know, I think a lot about philosophy as kind of crude as I am on it. And Darren Beatty, we did a Periscope. He blasted me on my philosophy, by the way. He corrected me right. on Martin and Hobbes really good. But I don't see these conservatives as being um, uh, well-read enough to understand that they're not asking good questions. And if you don't ask a good question, you can't get a good answer. You know, I, I totally agree. We have, we have a book called The Vanishing Tradition. It's an anthology discussing what's wrong with the conservative movement to which we do not belong. We've never been invited in and they've been our enemies. They've been my enemies for most of my life. Um, and they don't want to ask probing questions because uh, they might not get invited uh, onto other programs. They may lose friends on the left center. They can't have uh, a cocktail party with somebody from the New York Times. Uh, they're, 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 they're much more enmeshed with the center left, I would argue, than with anyone to the right. And they're usually very badly educated. I mean, they're basically educated as TV personalities or journalists. Um, and, you know, much of what had been the conservative intelligentsia of the middle of the, of the 20th century, with which I identified, um, you know, these people are just unknown. They've been displaced. They're considered too reactionary and so forth. So uh, I, I don't expect that much good to come from the conservative movement. I would say that I do see some hope from people who are the hardline pro-Trump uh, supporters. And, and the reason I, I, I see some hope from them is they're willing to go against the conservative movement which is quite the low, you know, we lost that election. Trump was a bad guy. You know, Biden is our president. So they, they don't say that. You know, they, they continue to uh, uh, to show the dangers. Well, who, of the who, 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 who do you include within that? If you read like the, the American Greatness website for which I write, um, mm. most of the people there, I probably have all kinds of philosophical and scholarly disagreements with, but I agree with them on, on, on current events. Someone like Victor Davis Hanson, I generally agree with. I, it's it's not that I think that Trump is God, but I think the forces that brought him down are evil, and they have to they have to be combated. And there were irregularities in the election. Uh, you know, even if Trump made a fool of himself and made noise and so forth, um, and those irregularities are going to come to uh, benefit the the left in future elections. Oh yes, yeah. whatever oh, yeah. irregularities were there will continue. Uh, to to plague us, and it's only these people on on the pro the, the hard pro Trump people who uh, who are they, they may be irrational in their love for Trump, but they're 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 usually correct about the dangers that we face and uh, the danger of the Democrats taking power. I, I, I got you. so um, I see I that, right? so okay. I hear an echo again. So uh, green shoots. 
uh, S says, Paul is a paleo conservative. I've heard you say that you're a paleo conservative. I don't know what a paleo conservative is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've, I was just asked by, by Cornell University to put together a handbook of paleo conservatives. And you have a, an Antifa handbook of a paleo conservative one. Uh, I, I invented the term paleo conservative to describe the, the resistance to the neoconservative takeover of the conservative movement in the 1980s but also pointing that they're not necessarily paleo in the sense of representing the old movement uh, as its leaders, because you know most of the, the paleo conservatives were not leaders of the conservative movement of the mid 20th century, but they do become the, the effective opposition to the neoconservatives. And they are pretty much driven out of the conservative movement in the 1990s, by the 1990s, many of them back Buchanan for president and he failed and so forth. And, uh, they were attacked by uh, by combined neoconservative and liberal forces. Um, many landed up losing jobs, uh, were professionally destroyed. Who do you else do you include within paleoconservatives? Excuse me. Who else do you include within paleoconservatives? Whom would I include? Yeah. If if you read our magazine, most people identify as paleoconservatives. Um, I know uh, Sam, Sam Francis is one of the, the the seminal thinkers of the paleoconservatives. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and most of the conservatives of the mid 20th century are by our definition, paleo conservatives, like Robert Nisbet is definitely a paleo conservative. Victor Davis Hanson. <clears throat> um, he is, he is a conservative by current definitions, but most of his views were those of, of liberals when I was in college and even graduate school. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he's terribly conservative. So and does, he has rather standard liberal views about history. So does and I, I there's a lot of questions here. So I, and I, and it's getting late. So but I want to go through all them. But does conservatism? When I think of the left, right, particularly its kind of current uh, iteration of it, I think of as kind of the monumentalization of science. These people literally all think that they're Galileo. It's insane, and uh, they're so atomized, and they're so kind of. Uh, the societies are so torn by centrifugal force and um, they're so solipsic that each one of them as a little component thinks that they're Galileo. It's insane, but there's a monumentalization of science. And when I think of the uh, conservatives sometime, maybe it's the right, I don't know. I think of kind of the monumentalization of religion. So, um, you know, I, I see kind of a, a fallback and I don't know, I'm asking, to uh, where things are defined in a, almost a biblical sense of uh, of defining politics along a kind of a, re a religiosity to it. Yeah, there, there, there is in the, a sense of piety, not strictly in a biblical sense, so I think that's also there, but sort of a reverence for tradition, for the way things used to be for communities. Now, I think what the paleoconservatives typically idolize you know, the way the world was before the left took it over. Um, what well, today we call the conservative movement is what the left was 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? Um, and it was that left which eventually uh, uh, eventually replaced the old right or the paleoconservatives who fought against them. Um, but I think the paleoconservatives represent a more genuine historic right. Uh, and... Uh, they're sort of religious in the sense that they revere their, you know, ancestral things, uh, the way things were. Many of them are, are very strong constitutionalists. Now you, you, know, have, they, uh, you have a kind of, do you have, and I, um, a somewhat, do you, do you think of yourself as having kind of a theological background? Um, sort of, yeah. No, I do believe in God. <laughs> I, I understand that. Just in terms of God. <laughs> That's a problem. No, no, no. But just, I mean, a theological background just in terms of, uh, you know, your academic, uh, Oh yes. No, no. I'm interested in, I'm interested in the history of religion and religious history, you know, in the West. I, that's one of my, my areas of interest. You did German, you were, uh, scholarship. A, a lot of it was on the German enlightenment. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm interested in German intellectual history and yeah. I've written extensively on that. Um, in, 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 um, uh, in some ways, the paleo conservatives are like more European than American. I've noticed that, you know, they'll say they're American nationalists or something like that. But, you know, they, they, they seem to have a, uh, an affinity for European conservatism. 
uh, even in, into the 19th century, or they, they all love Edmund Burke and so forth. So, so there, there's, there's very much of a, almost a kind of European cast of mind, and they don't like any discussion, paleoconservatives, of human rights or individual rights. You know, all rights are historic rights. You know, they come out of the past, that mystical past. They're part of our tradition, historical entailment, something like that. So they, 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 they fight with all other groups that speak about individual universal rights. Like, you know, what, why, why should we, I, I don't even argue these points anymore when I make political alliances. I'm for gun rights. If you want to believe it's a, it's a, it's a human right, that's fine. Go ahead and do we're it. We're going to go on. We're going to go on. We're going to go on. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to go on to the family feud round. We're almost there. So space stations, thank you so much for being here. And if I recall, I don't, I think you joined, uh, hopefully you did with the uh, space force investor series I did with Dennis Wingo. Cause that was awesome. I'm such, you know, you know, everyone knows I'm a big Space Force guy. And uh, I was so honored that uh, that uh, I had Dennis and also that uh, in the back room was um, was uh, Brigadier General Butel. So that was really cool, Bucky. So Space Station says left anarchists simply hate anything to the right of Shea and have an unhealthy communism fantasy. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> No, I, I, th I think it's an observation worth pondering. Um, but the, the, the part that I agree with is they have an unhealthy, they have a communist fantasy, which <clears throat> is interesting since they're really not communist, but they, they tend to idolize the communist past. You know, just the way paleoconservative idolize earlier ages, uh, you know, you hear uh, Ocasio-Cortez or Mark Bray or Bernie Sanders, this, they do love communist countries, communist societies, you know, uh, even, the, even the ones that disappeared. Uh, so I, I think there is an unhealthy communist fantasy which, uh, which underlies the, uh, the left. Uh, Freedom Channel uh, said something that, uh, something that you and I, I hear that echo again. Um, I feel like now there's two, now there's two, there's two echoes. So uh, Freedom Channel, um, let me hear if I still hear the echo. No, the echo's not. Okay, so Freedom Channel, thank you so much for being here, and that's a beautiful picture. It says, the forefathers were the best and smartest from all walks of life. And before you respond to that, you and I had a conversation about this, and I've thought about it a lot, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And you said, because I was critical of the elites today, and you're like, no, Adam, these are some, these are some very wise. They're very, very smart. They may not be good elites, but they are just as smart as the best has ever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. produced. Yeah, no, that, 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 I think that's absolutely true. Uh, these people probably score off the chart on IQ test. If you're sort of, you know, uh, 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 testing for raw cognitive ability, I'm sure they're as good as, you know, George Washington or Burke or uh, Immanuel Kant and whoever lived in the past, great thinkers. Um, <clears throat> just what they do with this intelligence, <laughs> that is sometimes frightening. Um, uh, so that, that's how I meant this, that these people are smart. Um, uh, God save us from the people with the high IQs. I mean, they are like Mark Zuckerberg. No, I, you know, or, or Jeff Bezos. I, uh, I worry about them. They're, and I discussed this on your thing also because I hear the echo. I hear the echo. And uh, I went on Kata Godfrey and uh, I discussed this with, you know, with a lot of people that I think that our tech oligarchs are dangerous in a way that, uh, you know, the Koch brothers never were, that Soros never was. Mm -hmm. Because they're they're a these tech oligarchs are beyond the power that they have that speaks for itself right. Right? You know, but beyond the power that they have their ability to wield it and the good cruelty and the bad cruelty and kind of the political science is that uh, I feel like they're all nihilistic and that they look at humanity as uh, as a failed business model and um, they uh, and they also have a bit of Asperger's right it's they're on kind of a scale. So they already have kind of this failure of empathy that we never had from Soros. Soros and the Koch brothers were many things, but right. uh, you never got this kind of psychopathic type of quality from them. Just uh, perhaps uh, not they're not good. I, you know, I'll let other people decide on the goodness of things. But uh, with, I, I feel like these tech oligarchs are just so far removed emotionally from the people that they rule over. I mean, these are not the Machiavelli's. Yeah. But, but they also seem to hate ordinary people. 
you know, they're the ones they're striking against. Um, uh, they don't like people with traditional values. Uh, I mean, they ally themselves with the cultural left. It's not that they're, you know, they're, they're somehow aloof from these cultural battles. They do take sides. And I mean, even if I were, I agree with everything you said, they have sort of Asperger symptoms, they, uh, they want total power, they don't see the world in a strange way. Uh, but, but why do they ally with Black Lives Matter? Why do they ally with the transgender movement? You know, uh, you know there, there, there's something strange there. <laughs> so with John Robb, and I remember, you know, I've, I, I have a very good memory and that could be a bad thing because I remember mean, bad things also, right? But I remember, uh, you know, my theory has always been that um, that um, everything is downstream of politics, right? And some people feel that everything is downstream of culture mm -hmm. and uh, that these megacorps are just trying to accommodate this brute force of culture right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And John Robb feels that that's a very big consideration is that these megacorps are a bit scared of it themselves mm -hmm. and they're just trying to accommodate the brute force of culture. Yeah, and, and the other point that I made before is they sometimes are trying to buy off the cultural left by doing favors for them, so they leave them alone. You know, the, uh, we're not going to use gender-specific pronouns, so we don't have to hire more women you know, as part of our workforce or hire more blacks or something like that. <laughs> yeah, and um, we're about to close up. We've been going on. Do you know it's been an hour and 45 minutes? This was a lot of fun, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um. So there was there were some good comments that uh, I saw here, and we're going to close up on one of them. There's a, there's a lot here, so we're going to definitely close up on one of them. It might be this one. I'm not sure. So Joe four six three again, a very nice picture on the water. Says I hope we survive the four years. We're going to survive in a way, and I'll respond to this first. And maybe it'll be the clergyman. I don't know. We're going to survive. I mean, America is always going to flourish. We've won the world. Us and China have won the world. But when we in four years. I tell everyone to keep a log and Paul, the same with you. You got to keep a daily log because all of this is happening faster than the mind can comprehend. That's right. I spend a lot of time every day keeping a log and detailing everything. It, uh, you're going to see the spectacles continue to get larger and larger and larger. You're going to see violence increase because violence has always increased to destabilize social patterns. But I, I think in all the world, America is going to be fine. It's just going to emerge something different. And then, Paul, my new theory, listen to this, is that we're going to have a, we're going to have a monarchy. <laughs> you mean we're going to be that lucky? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. If, if we're that, do you think we can have a monarchy? Uh, I think that that's somehow far into a sort of American democratic or Republican uh um, mentality. Uh, have a mon we we have had a mo monarchies in a you know in in practice like the Kennedys or this they were they were pretty disgusting monarchies come to think of it, but they they they, they only lasted a generation, <clears throat> and and didn't go beyond that. But I I just don't see I don't see monarchy as being in our future, unless I the changes are more radical than anything I could imagine. I do, and it might be because I'm misreading all of Machiavelli. He's my favorite political scientist, uh, or I'm misreading just so many of the others, and I probably am, because Darren blasted me. But I just feel like the net result is that people are unmanageable. People are unrulable. We're just unrulable. And the only way that this is going to uh, get fixed is with an immense amount of cruelty. And um, mm -hmm. monarchs are good at cruelty, right? They are. I mean, that's... You know, without well, the, no, actually, you monarchs are not good at cruelty. Authoritarian Republican leaders are. I mean, people who lead republics, sort of Machiavellian princes, you know, people who are th not traditional monarchs, uh, who usually rule by custom, stuff like traditions. Um, if you're saying we need an authoritarian leader to get us out of this mess, you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that I would not even question. Okay. Uh, so you corrected me now, too. Gosh. It's really <laughs> yes. And you and Darren know each other, so I get to tease you guys. Right? All right. And uh, so, yeah, you're right. You know, I'm glad. I'm glad you said that. You're right. And it's interesting because the media keeps on calling these uh, people authoritar authoritarian, and as though that's a bad thing. And I'm like, no, that's actually kind of what I want. I want somebody to kind of <laughs> over, right. Uh, so we're going to close with two last type of things. Um, so we're going to close, and I'm very interested. So Miss Meme 62, thank you very much. And that's really a, a nice picture that you've chosen. So um, I don't know how it began, but she said, 
but uh, she concludes it with, except for the insurrection hoax, you've obviously seen that and just kind of intellectually, kind of in your own kind of uh, introspection and extrospection, I guess, right? That's a really interesting thing that the media has done by uh, uniformly using the visuals, uh, the phraseology um, co cohesively and cons consistently across all the channels of insurrection. I know, it's, it's absolute nonsense. Uh, and that somehow Trump was engaging in sedition. I mean, this is utter nonsense. When he told everybody to peacefully assemble and the break-in was planned in advance, was going on while he was speaking. And it was not an insurrection. There was no attempt to overthrow the government. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, I, I don't see that the, uh, on, I, I, don't, I don't see it by the way, with these people burning down cities and they, they just weren't punished with the Democratic Party supported it directly or indirectly or together with Soros. But uh, I don't think either is really an insurrection. I mean, it has to be something much more massive and major to be an, an insurrection. A period of time. So I'm going to ask a question, then we're going to do a comment, then we're going to go. So mm -hmm. then I'm going to have my M&Ms, right? Because that's like a ritual thing I got. Right, right. So to recover from this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun though, right? So is when you look back, and this is what I'm so interested in. Maybe we'll do another Periscope on it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But is there any period of time or is there any kind of like moments that uh, that you look as kind of uh, similar, have, have a lot of the similar qualities to now? Well, I mean, I mean you could argue that, that every, um, uh, every historical epic in which, you know, regimes were coming apart <laughs> and in which there was enormous civil unrest uh, and, and faction sort of looks the same, I mean, from ancient times on, uh, but, that, but then you notice the circumstances differ. I mean, this, this is the thing that, you know, pre prevents me from being that sort of generalizer that some historians are, although I find them fun to read. But, uh, you know, th this looks very different to, in, in, from what happened in Russia in 1917, we're a very different society. It looks certainly very different from what happened in Greek city-states. Uh, or what happened even well what happened to the Roman Republic you can find some similarities but I wouldn't exaggerate the uh, the extent you know of of, of, of those uh, uh, of those overlaps uh, so I, I think there is something unique um, you know in, in everyone it's like you know somebody uh, points well the Holocaust you know you have to say it's unique and the answer is that, that every, every mass killing is unique in some ways. I mean, there may be overlaps, but they're also unique. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, here I, I think the, uh, um, we're dealing with, you know, a late modern civilization. It's very technically advanced. Uh, uh, it has very diverse populations, uh, but it has very different political assumptions from, from earlier societies that came apart and very, and very different types of elites. And it's a much more complex society in, in many ways. So it, it's, you know, I, 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 I try to avoid, um, you know, looking for similarities that, you know, are only apply in a very limited way. <clears throat> so we are about to close up. And let me just, I'm going to do one thing. So this was really, and there's some funny comments about you being the monarch. So I just want to let you know that. <laughs> okay. or, or about you being the authoritarian leader. Uh, and I don't, I don't want you to be that, Paul. I don't want you to be that guy. But, but that, that is the similarity, by the way. That, that's one similarity, that all these things end with authoritarian leaders. You that's know, all, 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 when societies come apart, they're typically, they typically have to be held together by authoritarian leaders. But will our system, I mean, the reaction to Trump is kind of the strong man, right? Because he came in as kind of the strong man. The reaction to Trump was that Nancy Pelosi uh, and the rest of the political establishment, they, got rid of <laughs> they didn't let him be the strong man, right? They didn't right. let him, uh, you know, wield kind of the, uh, the uh, flexibility of the constitution and the founding documents. Right. Uh, right. They didn't let him take a little bit from here and borrow from that and kind of increase his power mm -hmm. this way. Um, so I, there has to be a takeover. It can't just be uh, kind of a progression. Yeah, no, I, I can't. I can't see the authoritarian leader coming from the left, because the you know the uh, the the, the, uh, the left is so uh, is so chaotic, 
I mean, the kinds of things that they're doing, I mean, it simply leads to, leads to further dissolution of society. I mean, it, it could be like Julius Caesar, if you remember, he sort of comes out of the Roman left, you know, and then, and then creates an imperial rule, you know, into which the, uh, the, 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 the lower classes are drawn, the populare simply become part, you know, part of the ruling system and then becomes very centralized in the military, it's a military dictatorship. But he was uh, hard. He made mistakes. I military dictatorship. <laughs> I like Augustus. I've studied this a lot. And I'll tell you, because you were talking about Hellenist history, is I'm on probably my fifth or sixth reading of um, uh, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm on several different translations. And I've, I'm about to go with um, the, uh, the quick bio of Alcibiades, too. So I just love that period of history. Right. I actually kind of look at similarities to where we are now just in terms of how well it was articulated by Thucydides and how tyrannies always turn inwards. I right. thought that's right. my takeaway is that my takeaway from that was tyrannies always turn inwards. That's what happened to Athens. It's what happened to Sparta. Yeah, they so all that. came in, right? And it was a horrific type of thing. We're, gonna, we're about to close up, okay? So before we close up, you've got a book coming out and it's about Antifa. And it's one of the things that brought us here today because I'm so fascinated by Antifa. So can you discuss that really briefly? Yeah, the, the the book only deals with 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 Antifa in the first and concluding chapters. The rest of it is sort of a hint history of anti-fascism. Uh, the anti-fascist, uh, many of whom were Marxists, some of whom were classical liberals in interwar Europe, uh, the Frankfurt School, um, and then you know the development of anti-fascism into a kind of therapeutic ideology that we have to cure people of fascist attitudes. The state has to assume control over their lives. And, and that's sort of a bridge to where we are now, right? Because, uh, you know, fascism is seen as a dangerous mental disorder. And we either have to cure that by sending people to re-education camps or get rid of the people who are doing this. So um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the present Antifa seems to be sort of, the, it's the beginning and the end of my study, because I sort of look at where they are now, and then I look at the history of anti-fascism over a 90 year period <clears throat> and your book is coming out when um it's probably going to be coming out early summer <laughs> i am fascinated by antifa from the very first time i heard of them i was mm -hmm. fascinated by them when you said they were a very important very probably one of the uh strongest social movements of the last 50 years is that is how i first became intrigued by them oh, absolutely yeah it, and it takes various forms but 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 anti-fascism it's like, you know, a leading political theme and there are all sorts of movements that have been organized. Like the, the feminists in England call themselves the anti-fascist feminist or something like that. So the, the, the term anti-fascist just keeps coming. That's what I argue, that fascism is the great enemy. You know, even racism, sexism, everything is sort of encapsulated, you know, in the, uh, the, the devil term fascism. So we are, uh, there's, so this was part one, right? Uh, because it was actually kind of a discussion of the Nazis, right? Because I'm just so interested in political operating systems and how these things are classified. And then I'm particularly interested in Antifa, which, you know, represents itself as uh, as kind of the uh, adversarial brute force opposition to it, even though that's clearly not what they are. And part two is going to be Jack Posobiec. He just came out with a movie. I actually saw his movie. I think it's very helpful to see the visuals because uh, the it looks so much, the tactics of Antifa looks exactly, the individuals that they use to sell their own propaganda to recruit as a recruitment tool, they are showing a lot of Nazi type of stuff. And they recruit a lot of very emotionally weak and vulnerable people by sending out these kind of like beacons and by allowing people this kind of Homeric type of fantasy, right? Cause that's what they're doing. So we're gonna, so, um, we're going to look at uh, Jack's movie and then we're going to come back and we're all going to say goodbye. So this is very exciting for me. So uh, this is going to be Jack's movie. Uh, we're going to look at it. I think it's a two minute preview or a minute and a half preview. And then we're all going to come back. So I'll see everybody in a minute and a half. Times to be organized and orchestrated chaos. They call everybody they disagree with Nazis. I felt like I had no choice. 
but to do what I did. So yeah, kill them. Kill the Nazis. Long live the Socialist Revolution. When conditions become right, people do get the opportunity to change the whole system through a revolutionary struggle. The International Revolutionary People's Guerrilla Forces work to defend social revolutions around the world. We gotta fight it out. We're gonna remake this country in the street. <laughs> Liberals get the f***ing wall first. Someday, we gotta knock those mother to control this thing right on their ass. That was awesome, right? Wasn't that interesting? It was. <laughs> I know. I want to join. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Um, so we are going to close. Now I'm going to look for a closing comment because the closing comments are the one when, when like, it's there that people mm -hmm. are always going to see. So we're going to close on this one. Thank you so much, uh, Lex, for uh, saying that because that's going to be the closing comment now. So that's awesome. I am going – when I when I press the button – Everybody's going to go away, but you're going to stay with me. So we can close up and just say, you can watch me to a couple of M&Ms. Everybody has been so kind um, for allowing Paul and I to be the guest on your uh, on your feed. And uh, hopefully everybody uh, had a good time and uh, that we were a good guest and uh, thoughtful guest. Paul? Okay. <laughs> so so then I guess I didn't leave you much of a closing comment, so... You can do your departing comment. No, that that that's fine. Um, uh, I, 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 is that part of the movie that I just saw? The um, what is uh, that? What, what Jack is making on on Antifa. He did that documentary. It's called Antifa the movie. I'll send you a copy of it. Right. I'll send you a okay, copy. Okay, that that would be fine. It's, I am it's awesome. It's really good. I think of you guys as yeah. kind of there's this harmony between your own yeah. academia. And then he infiltrated it. So he saw kind of like the on the ground tactical qualities of it, as well as their recruitment efforts, how they get these emotionally vulnerable people to kind of have this Homeric fantasy. And it's just really interesting. Yeah, I mean, actually the communist movie has nothing to do with what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's a kind of glorious backdrop for their own activism. Yeah. <laughs> they have nothing in common with Lenin or Mao or any of these people. It's, it's, it's all fantasy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so when your book comes out, it's almost probably going to be around the same time as his book comes mm -hmm. out. And then we're doing that thing. So I'll definitely facilitate the introduction to you guys because I'm really impressed with the way he infiltrated them. And he's awesome. And you're awesome because you give kind of the, uh, the um, higher view of it just in terms of the contextual kind of framework of it. So I had uh, such a good time. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, I guess with that, we're, we're going to say goodbye. So I'm going to press the button. And now it says, do you really want to end the broadcast? And I do. So thank you, everybody. And I will see.